Today's guest is a Liverpool-born British dark artist, specializing in the unexplained horror and science fiction. His work includes elements inspired by ancient cultures, folklore, legend, and the occult. He's created album covers and various art for clients, including Rob Zombie, Slayer, Ministry, Rammstein, Filter, Iron Maiden, Kiss, Clive Barker, Stan Lee, and the X-Files, to name just a few. Please welcome to Inside Art Head, the artist, Mr. Sam Sharon. Greetings, everyone, and thanks for joining the Inside Art Head podcast. It's here we'll explore the inspiration, motivation, process, and fulfillment of creating art. I'm your host, Roni Zulu, bringing you inspirational stories from artists around the world. Today we have on the show Mr. Sam Sharon. Sam, thank you for being on the show and allowing us to get inside your art head. Well, Zulu, Grandmaster Zulu, uh, I appreciate the invite. And it's good to see you again. You're looking well. It's good to see you. It's been a while since our days running the streets and nights of Los Angeles. So let's uh, bring everybody into our little world, but more so into your world. Uh, I'd like to start off with letting everybody know that I am a big fan of Mr. Sam's work. There's only about three portraits of myself in my home that have been gifted to me by other artists, and two of them have been done by Mr. Sam. And one of them is very special to me. It's a portrait of my wife and I that is over our headboard. So this man's pretty special, as you're about to find out. So, uh, Mr. Sam, the one thing that I really wondered, I've seen a lot of your paintings, drawings, charcoal, pencil. I've seen all of this stuff. And that alone could be enough for you to have a budding career. I would like to know what moved you to digital art? That's a great question. Um, I don't think anyone's ever, ever asked that before. Um, I do, as you say, love the traditional, the, the getting your fingers dirty kind of artwork. Um, and, and of course, I still do that. You know, I, I will draw live every week kind of thing. But um, the digital really captivated me when I started to see um, others using it in the world for book covers and album covers for bands and things like that, and generally for just portrait work. And so I dabbled in it. And a lot of people at the time said, you know, oh, it's it's not real art. You know, there was that stigma that it's not, uh, you're not really doing it, the computer's doing it. So I... You know, from uh, my late teens, uh, I was in art college, and, and that was all very traditional. But moving on to university and then into my early 20s, the rise of, of Photoshop and, and all of these painting programs started to appear on the scene. And, and back then, they were fairly basic, but um, I wanted to explore it and see what people were talking about. And sure enough, I discovered it isn't the computer doing it at all, um, unlike the AI atrocities we have today, but um, mm -hmm. back then and even now, Photoshop uh, still requires you to push the pixels, so to speak. Uh, the, the digital is still the paintbrush. You're still moving the shapes and you're drawing with a mouse, albeit a, uh, a series of electronical signals that are being moved around. You're doing the painting. And so I think the attraction really was the speed that I have so much in my head, as I'm sure you can agree as an artist yourself, there's so much going on at one time. There's never enough time in the day to execute all of it. And so really it was, in a way, uh, a new freedom to, to save time, to, to not have to wait for paint to dry, um, to not have to run to the store because you've run out of crimson. You know, <laughs> um, it, it, was, it, it was suddenly, wow, limitless. You know, I think that's the main pull. And I am really glad that you brought up that little bit about AI because that was on my list of questions to ask you because as of late, when you say digital artists, I think most people's brain goes to AI because it's so popular right now. And as you pointed out, if you're using Photoshop and drawing uh, programs like you do, 
You're only as good as you can draw on paper. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, of course, there are tricks uh, in photography itself where you can up the contrast and change the colors and that kind of thing. But as you say, you're only as good as, as, as your own skills with an eye. And, and you know, the hand-eye coordination is still very much a piece of that. Um, you, you can't tell the mouse or even the, the digital drawing pen some people use. I use a mouse um, to draw with. Uh, and I'm still the one who's moving the cursor around. So uh, you're quite right. Um, with AI, uh, it's as far as I understand it, um, it's simply a prompt program where you will type in certain words and then the machine or the program will then uh, source its database of references that have been fed into it, almost like a little filing cabinet, and it will go and do the work and it will piece the things together based on its own learning curve of study that people have fed other people's work into it. And that's where a lot of the controversy, um, another artist, a great artist, Molly Crabapple, she's very vocal about how it's, uh, it's, it's very harmful for real artists because it's not only um, taking people's work that it will train upon and so you know, you, you could love uh, a, a Ronnie Zulu piece and then all of a sudden there's a hundred of them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not his, that's the AI, and that's terrible. The same with Salvador Dali, you know, you could have an original or a print of his, but then if his work is fed into a machine, it can then learn and then it can start to, you know, produce anything you ask it to based on the style it has learned and scraped, as they call it, mm -hmm. from someone else. Um, and I think it's... It's a fascinating tool. I think we're st we are still obviously in the early days of it. It has its uses. Um, I think its uses should be in the medical field. I think it should be mm -hmm. in places where we need it. Mm -hmm. In in uh, you know not the creative realm of of music even and writing and art. Uh, it it should be left to the humans to do that. And I agree with you, especially the human part that you just mentioned because. If you can't meet an AI in an art gallery and ask it why you did that or what experiences led up to that art, and uh, that's a human thing. So I, I hope that yeah. uh, it doesn't run too much of a muck. I, again, I think, you know, the cat is out of the bag. Uh, fellow yeah. artist friends of mine who do use it, um, some have defended it and have said, you have to move with the times, it's happening. You need to take it on board and start using it yourself and, and adapt to it. And I disagree, I very, very strongly disagree. It's it's not for that, you know? Well, I disagree as well because you know I still get dirty and smelly with oils and linseeds and glue and canvas. So uh, oh, let's yeah. both keep doing that. Um, let, let's uh, get some of the viewers in on who may have not seen your work if no one, if you meet someone who hasn't seen your work and they ask, how do you describe your work? What do you say to them? Um, gosh, you know, it's really hard to blow your own trumpet sometimes and say, well, I do this. Um, but that's uh, okay. We want to, we want to hear you uh, this is play a little are. tune right uh, now. <laughs> yeah, you, you did ask the question. So um, I think if, if anyone wants to sort of uh, have an introduction to my work, they could perhaps um, see it as a darker side, uh, the shadow of every day, things that you don't normally see that will sit in the corner just out of sight, but I'm showing it to you. Um, things that you, you might dare to dream about or think about when you're going to sleep, but wouldn't you know dream of telling anybody else. I'll show it to people. Um, I like to illustrate things you don't see every day. Mm -hmm. um, I like to bring life to literature, uh, especially horror and things that really rise up the emotions of fear and curiosity and freakishness and to sort of look upon it from a natural history point of view um it's all real to me the supernatural is real and i don't think uh shying away from it does anyone's favors we should embrace it we should look at it we should study it and we should celebrate all of the strange and wonderful things that you don't see every day um, so i think that's that's generally how i would describe my work things you don't normally see I would have to agree, and with that, um, I would like to ask you about those things you don't normally see uh, in the outside world, and sometimes that we shy away from ourselves internally. 
a lot of we all have a dark side a lot of people don't want to admit it but we do what's the importance of knowing facing and befriending your dark side I think, uh, well, that's a great question because, again, not too many people uh, not only would admit what they think about, but um, I don't think too many people really think about why, um, you know, certain images will flash through their minds, uh, whether they're making a film or writing a story, you know, they'll have these influences from other things around them that have appealed to them. And they'll have that little storage of their own, much like the AI machine, if you like. They'll have their own <laughs> little filing cabinet in their mind that they will refer to every now and then, but never truly ex execute that into any form of uh, music, even film, television, writing, and art, 2D, but uh, even sculpture, you know. I think it's important to show it. It's important to get it out of there. Um, because you don't see it every day. And I think if if you start to label things uh, with hate and freakishness mm -hmm. in terms of a negative influence to say that, well, this is horrible, this is wrong, this is strange. You are running a sort of a P.T. Barnum carnival where you're taking people's money to see the, the weird and the wonderful. Um, but those people had lives too. And I think, you know, we're beyond that age now. We're in, a, we're in an age where people are exploring the older ways, the older religions um, post any Judeo-Christian religion, people are looking beyond that into Norwegian mythology, into ancient Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. um, and of course the heathens and what would be called the pagans by the Christians, the heathens across Europe, uh, even at, at Christmas time, is a very big passion of mine, is, is all of these strange legends of creatures that live in the woods that were really mainly warning stories for people to not wander off or for children to not go strolling off into the woods at night when it's cold and, and wintry but these creatures were believed by many people to be real things and so i think it's important that we share this and celebrate this weird and wonderful world because if you don't you know you might fall into the danger of becoming victim to things that other people might deem hateful or harmful which really just aren't i'm i'm glad you brought that up about the holidays because one thing that i love is i can't wait for the Yule season to come around to see what you do with Krampus. <laughs> <laughs> He's always a very interesting fellow. Uh, what, what's your relationship with Krampus? I, I think you kind of like this fellow a bit. <laughs> it's it's certainly a passion project. It's um, what I call my my world of of creepy Christmas. It's uh, and I and I don't use the the word winter so much um, as the season encompasses Christmas. Mm -hmm into so many other factions of, of beyond the season itself. It, it, it really is a traditional um, season, holiday, that is, is passed down through hundreds and thousands of years, again, of these strange creatures that would live in the woods. And we have stories of wild men, of Bigfoot-like creatures across Europe through the Middle Ages. And who's to say that these things were not another lineage of humanity that perhaps was still surviving and they were deemed the monsters because they were different and i think that's been carried on through the centuries from town to town you know those people over there those people over there is always you know separating segregation of different types of people is always something that's been used politically and through artwork to control people to influence people to sway people and to keep people safe and the krampus aspect of this strange companion to saint nicholas that he would become uh, has sort of won over the hearts of people across the world uh, in recent years. Maybe over the last 10 or 15 years, he's really had a resurgence, particularly across America. And we have these major mo motion pictures coming out in movies um, depicting this strange devil, this different one, this dark character that would be the one that would punish children, that would um, drag men into the street and whip them. Uh, it, that would take chained men to the depths of hell and eat them alive or burn them, you know. Uh, and it, again, it was really in, in many places across Europe was was the sort of legend to keep people behaved, to keep children in, in check and make sure that they weren't wandering off or stealing fruit or any of that kind of thing. But I'm fascinated um, by differences and by ancient cultures and how it's always been there. This isn't new. Mm. This is way beyond. This is thousands of years old. 
Um, in truth, uh, not many people know this, but the origin of Krampus itself is unknown. There is no particular pinpoint. Mm. There are scholars that will, you know, maintain, oh, it's the companion of St. Nicholas, as I mentioned. Others will say it goes far further flung to earlier religions. Some say it goes pre-Norwegian mythology. This strange, horned, hairy beast creature that was always there to step in alongside the good, to enforce the good. And there's an interesting point, isn't there? That this dark character is in fact addressing and wrapping in a nice big colorful bow what is good by showing you what is awful and i find that i think that's fascinating i think that's fascinating i think it's very important uh i th i think your world shows people as we've kind of alluded to a side of them that they might be afraid of or preconceived notions about something and your work seems to if not break down those notions, at least challenge people to examine them. Yes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Giving a face to something is, it's easy. Uh, giving a name and a label to something is easy. And so few people really look at the origins as to why. Um, and I think if you attract them with colorful artwork, with music and writing, you know, you, you're inviting them in almost um, not in a deceitful way or a sort of, you know, uh, sleight of hand way but you are tricking them in a sense to look a little deeper and I don't think there's anything wrong with that because more people should definitely now your artwork has a very um, in line with all of what you've just said has a very mystical it has an other world feel I've seen a lot of different art in the horror mystic dark genre and yours really stands out. It's not exactly blood gore, even if you throw some gore in there. There's something about your work that still has this mystical, otherworld, dreamlike. It's very dreamlike, if you were to ask me. Was, was that intentional or did it just happen, your style? Did, did you want it to be that way? Um, in, in some ways, yes. Um, I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, and thank you for the warm words and the compliments there. It's, it's important, I feel, when, when you are illustrating horror, to not, as you say, just slap blood on there. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the, you have, uh, you could sort of liken it to a, a crazed madman in the street with a butcher's knife or an incredibly skilled swordsman, mm -hmm. you know, which is going to carve you up more efficiently. You know, it's, uh, it's easy to just go stabbing away and saying, this is horror. But when you give it a little romance, a, a bit of history, a little meaning, and, and those dreamscapes and that, that sort of ethereal feel to make it uh, in some ways almost pinpointable to history, to mythology, to say this is a real place. You can visit this. I think it's really important to illustrate and address things. And you, I notice you do much the same yourself with your oil paintings. Every portrait you, you put together, you, you really do piece so much symbolism in there and it's not just oh here's a great skilled artist who can do a portrait you put a lot of layers of meaning into your work and i see that too and i love it uh very very much love the portrait you did of me as well so <laughs> thank you and a little bias there of course no but, it's, you know. it's funny you say that because of all the portraits i've done when people see yours oddly enough they find it the most mysterious and they ask the most questions <laughs> <laughs> ah, well, wonderful. <laughs> I, I kind of like that. <laughs> Speaking great. of you, let's get in a little further inside your art head. Have you ever illustrated a dream that you had or one of your own nightmares? Or a character um, in one? You know, it's interesting that they're sort of, they're in the big uh, pile of things to do. <laughs> uh, that I have in my mind. You know, I was, I was mentioning earlier, you know, everyone has the filing cabinet in their mind of, of all of their sort of um, goals of, of artwork to execute and that can, kind of thing and their references. I also have a big dirty pile of paper and scraps and notes in my mind as well that are sort of just to the side that I, I can't throw away, but I've yet to really find a place for them. So, so uh, I, I can't to the, you know, 
nothing comes to mind at this second mm -hmm. uh, but there are there are characters and creatures and moments um, things that have happened to me even in life that I, yes. I want to address as, at some point you know real life things that have happened to me that I can't explain um, that I want to put onto paper to sort of show the world okay this happened to me in a sense so um, as yet no <laughs> the, in short the answer is no <laughs> well, but to I'm, be I'm sure we're all very curious about what that would be because I would imagine for you that could be a little scary that would be very much exposing yourself uh, maybe showing everyone your fears yes yeah yeah, very much so. And and also it's um I think it's putting it off is also the fear of, of doing it justice. I'm one of those mm. people that's um yeah. I like to take my, my sweet time on a piece <laughs> because uh you know, and sometimes I'll I'll push a deadline out because it's just too important. I can't just throw something out there. You know, it has to have it has to be justified in its time and place. So again it's the fear of, of, of getting it right and me being satisfied with it and as yourself as an artist you i'm sure every artist out there will agree we're never happy with our work you know, there's no. always something we're going to change there's always that last little thing that oh maybe if it was this um and we have to step away at some point as, as it's an old saying isn't it you know you have no artwork is ever finished was that picasso i forget yeah but uh <laughs> it's only ever abandoned it was the line but yeah it's um it's wanting to do it justice and, and yeah, facing the fears of dreams and things and bringing it to life and sort of putting a, a, a finger pointing at it. You know, sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night and there'll be a face in the corner hanging out of the ceiling and, and it'll terrify me. And then I'll sort of get my breaths and, and realize, you know, it was a dream or was it? I don't know. And those are the things that I think if I were to illustrate, am I doing them a disservice? Are they meant to remain unseen? Who knows? Um, <laughs> Maybe I should test that water. Well, I understand uh, what you mean by all of what you said because I've yet to do a self-portrait and everybody thinks it's odd, but uh, you got to do it justice and be pre prepared to uh, uh, expose yourself because I'm yep. not going to paint yeah, myself yeah, yeah. as some you know bright shining you know knight <laughs> who's not afraid of everything because it would just be a lie. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah it's got to be. I've tried. I've tried. <laughs> um, you know, I've done the odd uh, self-portrait for fun in the past. Um, and I think it was two, three years ago, I sat down and, and thought, okay, I'm going to do a piece that really represents me. And I'm going to, similar to your work, I was, I was, you know, wanting to include certain little statues and things and books I was holding that would mean something to me and put this ultimate portrait together. And I did begin it and, and it's still sitting in the in process you know with its layers in photoshop and it's all there and i have my my sketches and references and i'm just not happy with me and how i am perceiving my, even myself so i'm i'm worried how will others perceive me if i can't you know enjoy what i've done for my own self and it's very self-indulgent it's very pretentious and that in itself is terrifying because you don't want to be perceived that way either so it's quite uh it's quite a daunting task to say, look at me, everybody. Aren't I amazing? You know, it's, it's hard to do that. Yeah, I, I completely uh, empathize with you there. Um, but I can't wait to see yours when you do it, you know. Well, we'll, we'll have a little group therapy session and get those yeah. paintings going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is, is there a specific work that you've done or a project that you might call somewhat of a milestone? whether it was a turning point in your career and even if it wasn't a turning point it was at least a piece that you look at and go that's whoa man that might be my magnum opus at this point is there some piece that is like oh man that mm. there's in in the different fields and genres that i illustrate for the they whether it's rock music for album sleeves or whether it's book covers for cryptozoology and um, people who look for Bigfoot and, and the Loch Ness Monster, that kind of thing, or whether it's um, artwork for somebody's podcast or a portrait of them or whether it's, you know, as I say, a whole plethora of different genres. There's always a piece that I've done somewhere along the world where I'm, 
I look at it and I think, oh, that was good. Mm -hmm. I think I hit something there. And it's very rare I'll do something for myself that I enjoy. Uh, again, I think you can relate. Where When you create for other people, it seems to be much easier because you can read them a lot easier, but sometimes better than they can, much as someone can read us better than we can read ourselves. So when I create a piece of work for myself, it's very rare that I'm happy with it. But I think one turning point was when I did the portrait of Edgar Allan Poe. Mm. Because that, for whatever reason, probably just because he's so damn popular, it uh, it went viral. It, it, it became uh, a very popular piece. It's my highest selling print so far. Um, it's appeared on book covers where I've had to shut them down and say, no, no, I own that. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh, it's it's appeared, and I hate doing that, but you have to, yes. you know. Um, it's a, it's an awful feeling. So I let my manager do it. Mm -hmm. She's wonderful. Um, uh, Italia Gandolfo, absolutely wonderful woman. Um, so she does all of my hard work <laughs> by putting people in check. Um, but it's appeared in in theatre as giant posters. So there was one day in in Los Angeles. It was a you know uh, a nice sunny day. I was on the way to see a friend at a studio. I wasn't familiar with the area, so I'd Ubered to that zone and then walked the rest of the way looking at my phone and I stopped to sort of check where I was and I looked up and there was a black box theater in North Hollywood with a huge billboard of Edgar Allan Poe, but it was my work. And of all of the places in the sprawling metropolis of Los Angeles, I just happened to be there at that one point in time to see it. And I thought, well, isn't that strange? Everything happens for a reason and that was meant to be. Um, I contacted the gallery and I said, you know, where did you get this from kind of thing? And um, they were very apologetic. And I said, don't worry about it. Just have fun with it. But, um, you know, maybe we can talk about it in the future and do something else. And the chap turned out to be a distant relative of Poe. And so I thought that wow. was even stranger, how it all kind of comes full circle mm -hmm. in the end. But that piece, um, looking about it, back at it, you know, I, I feel... It's, it's not my greatest piece by any means, by any stretch, but it, it opened a door to me wanting to do other characters and more and more with that world because it seems to be forgotten in a way that um, the commercialization of, of Halloween has become uh, almost like a Disney product mm. uh, and it's not scary anymore. There's no emotion, there's no soul, there's no creepiness anymore. It doesn't seem to... Now, it may be the fact that I'm 45 and I'm not a child anymore that's scared by things, but <laughs> but I want to be scared, you know. I want to be um, completely, you know, mesmerized by spooky, creepy things, and it just doesn't seem to be there. So that really did open a door for me to sort of say, okay, well, let's go back into that because this is what I do. So, and I think that really gave birth to the Christmas thing that I'm, you know completely engrossed with right now is finding the sort of the darker side to Christmas. Now you mentioned um, this Edgar Allan Poe theater. I happen to know that you're an actor as well as a <laughs> visual arts. There's more visual things you do than just pen and paper. And I happen to know that there was a theatrical performance of Dracula and you played the main role. Now, Tell us about that. Is that an extension of your art, a different art? D talk about the creativity or give us something about that. That was that was something that I, I've toyed with in my mind for a long time. And I've been living in Los Angeles for a number of years. And of course, we're living on Hollywood's doorstep. Um, relatives of mine have, have been in the acting field, my cousin Rachel. Uh, she's an actress. So it's in the blood. It's in the family. Um, but it wasn't anything that I went to school for. It wasn't anything that I'd ever really pursued at school or in college. But it was always bugging me in the back of my mind. I'd go and see movies very regularly with my friends. And I'd look at the big screen and I, and I would think, like most people do, you know, I could do that. <laughs> I, I want to do that. I want to do that. I want a piece of that. You know, I could do that. Um, and I think that's the artist in me wanting to make films as well is to sort of really get into that um, fantasy world, as you say, in the dream world, but to live it and breathe within the painting, to sort of become part of a living version of that image that influences you. Um, and so I decided, okay, I'm gonna, uh, 
I'm going to join a sort of an acting agency and, and I found one online and this first thing popped up, uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, and I thought, no, surely not. And I looked at the casting, was looking for the title role of Dracula. So I thought, okay, what the hell? And I, uh, I applied and then I got a response based on my headshot. And then I went to the theater and I, I was told to sort of recite, uh, you know, a number of lines on stage from anything I wanted, um, to the director and just him sitting there in the audience and just me on stage. And I'd never done this in my life. I'd done a little bit of theatre down in London, mm. um, maybe 10 years prior. But that wasn't, uh, you know, that wasn't a sort of a, an audition process. That was a theatre group that I had joined and that, that was a long time ago. But this was different. This was the real deal. This was, wow, I'm on a stage auditioning in Hollywood for a theatre production. You know, this is, they say that if you want to get in film and television to, to go the theatre route to really brush up your chops and your acting and your voice and being able to understand, you know, the levels of everything from the emotion to the sound to the delivery, everything. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to train with that and go with that and see what it's all about. And um, sure enough, uh, there were four other Draculas sitting in the <laughs> waiting room, you know, waiting to do their piece. Um, and I heard the first guy go in and he was booming in all this Shakespeare, big loud guy I could hear through the wall. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm not going to get this. And then uh, another chap went in and he did his thing and you could hear him through the sort of air vents in the waiting room doing his piece in the next room which was the big theater room and then i went in and i did my thing and um i recited uh the lyrics to typo negatives black number one mm. the song um but i read it in a poem form well i spoke it in a poem form um in a sort of a christopher lee oh, yeah. uh, with me being being british i did my <laughs> best course. british and you know a christopher lee thing you know <laughs> And did the whole shebang from the lyrics, which was really strange to sort of have that song in spoken in a Christopher Lee sort of way. And the the director sort of dropped his pen and said, um, could you just wait outside for me for a moment? And then he brought in a, a girl who was auditioning for Mina and brought me back in. And then he auditioned another girl and brought me back in again. And this is all on the same day. Mm. And before I knew it, I got I got a call the next day. Um, we'd really like to offer you the part if you'll take it. And that was it. The rest is history. I did 20 shows playing, you know, Count Dracula with a cast of 13. Each show was two hours long. Um, every night I got to kiss the girl and die. <laughs> um, and it was, it was fantastic. And, it, it, you know, again, as I mentioned, it, it was very much... Um, living and breathing the artwork it was becoming that creature that that monster that he is this tragedy figure um this broken-hearted man that will not die you know um who's lost his love and it was a really powerful way to explore the story even further we all know the story but then mm -hmm. to live it and to to sort of research it and train it and become that really woeful upset character um, it gave me another experience of Dracula, the book. It gave me a whole new way of seeing it and feeling it. And it was, a, it was an experience I'll never forget. Um, so who knows what's next? <laughs> Frankenstein, who knows? <laughs> well, I like that it seems that uh, the way you just explained and how you felt who Dracula was, it also comes through with your artwork. Uh, it seems that they're just not scary. They they have a heart. They have feelings, and there's things that made them who they are. And they might not necessarily enjoy that. And I, I think your art kind of brings some of that to light. It's interesting to hear you speak of Dracula in the same way that your art evokes a similar emotion. And I that, with yeah. your Dracula, uh, let's talk about getting the part, because you get the part. A lot. You've done artwork, oh my gosh, for Rob Zombie, Slayer, Ministry, Ramstein, Filter, Iron Maiden, Kiss, Clive Barker, Stanley, X File. I could go on. We don't have enough time. Um, you get the part. Just like when you spoke about when that director was in the audience and it's just you and him. What is it when you get, you know, all these famous 
bands and these famous people, people like Clive Barker, all all these people come to you and say, I want, I have a vision and I want you to illustrate it. How does that come about? Do they contact you? Do you solicit them? Uh, it's a mixed bag. Um, it really is. It's one of those um, uh, situations where sometimes if I'm a, a fan of a particular thing, if and, and I use that word very strongly, you know, when I admire and I'm fanatical about a particular world, such as Clive Barker has his own world mm. um, of sex, death, horror, misery, dreamlike you know, fantastical creatures. Um, I'm fanatical about that, that, uh, that whole universe he's created for himself. And so being a fellow Liverpudlian, uh, you know, we were both born in Liverpool, England. Um, I met Clive and I put that across to him that I was from Liverpool and we had a really nice rapport and we had a good conversation. And, and I said to him, you know, I, I'd absolutely love to create for you someday, you know, work with you and illustrate some of your ideas. And the rest is history. That's how that came about. But other times, um, I will just cold call and uh, you know email someone out of the blue and say, "Really love the work. Would would like to create for you." And it comes about uh, in that way where they will they they'll then say, "Oh, you know," they'll look at my resume and the names you've reeled off there. They'll see that I've done for X, Y, Z, and and then I you know I can put my money where my mouth is and I'm good mm-hmm. for it because there's the track record, so to speak. Um, and other times I, I will be referred to by friends of theirs. Um, I'll do an album for somebody and they'll say, oh, you should get Sam to do this. Or, or oh, wow, that's, you know, that's definitely, you know, your world for, for this guy. Um, much was the case with um, uh, Andy Biersek from the Black Veil Brides, Andy Black. Uh, he was the singer of the Black Veil Brides and he was doing a spoken word uh, LP vinyl um, reading out Edgar Allan Poe stories. I think he did four of them. And it was recorded, and he was he wanted to release this. And so um, Rob Nicholson, uh, Blasco, um, he uh, was managing them at the time, reached out and was of the mind, oh, Sam's done the Edgar Allan Poe portrait. There's a perfect sort of marriage in a sense. He has to illustrate you in that same way to give it that vibe. And that's how that sort of came about, because... It, it seemed to be a perfect fit. Um, and again, other times people will just stumble across my work and email me um, and say, you know, uh, I loved what you did for X, Y, Z. Could you do something similar for us? And that, it tends to have escalated over the time. You know, it's it's tricky in the art world, as you know, to see, to see uh, a path. There's mm. no real one direction. It's like a, a family tree of everybody you know around you. Uh, large and small clients, big names, small names. It doesn't matter to me if I enjoy the individual or the group or the band or the publisher. And it seems to be a world that I want to be a part of. um, I'll go down that road and we'll have that conversation and it will come about, you know. Uh, For me, it's not always about um, the status of who. Um, And again, you know, I don't like blowing my own trumpet. I don't like to sort of name drop um, but that is very important when it comes to approaching someone who hasn't heard of you. And of course, not everyone has heard of me. And so sometimes it's quite a challenge to say, hey, I'm not some kid in his basement. You know, I'm, I'm a professional. I've done this for 20 years. This is what I do. And here's some of my work. And getting people to just look at it is half the battle. But once you're in, if you're confident enough and you have that gusto of presentation, um, you know, the rest is up to them, whether they mm. even like your work, you know, it's, it's then on their table. I would imagine, of course, you would have to be able to present a impressive resume if you're going to seek out people of these high calibers. And a lot of these celebrities and a lot of these bands, they're already well established and they're well known for what they do. Is it difficult at times or not? to illustrate from them? Do they give you free reign? Do they say, listen, we already have an idea? I'm I'm sure it's a mix of both. How do you, I guess what I'm asking, how do you keep Mr. Sam in that picture? If it's a ministry album cover, (laughs) it's a ministry album cover, but there's gotta be some Mr. Sam in there. How how do you maintain that? 
That's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, for the longest time, uh, it, it would never have occurred to me because I didn't think it was attainable to have your own style. And I was never sure of exactly how that would ever come about, um, especially working in the realm of digital art. I use a mouse, and I think that's what makes me stand out from other people who will use a digital pen or a, or a Wacom table or, or Intruus Wacom tables, as I think they're called. I use a mouse, as I've said before. Um, and so my execution of, of digital painting, if I've done an, uh, a pencil illustration or an ink sketch, and, I, and I've scanned it in, and then I want to start adding color and depth and tone and texture to it and really start to paint into that, um, my technique is completely different. With people who use the, the digital pen, they run the risk of it looking very samey to other people. It looks very, very familiar uh, to someone else's work. It very, you know, there's a lot of the same thing going on because it's a technique that can only be executed in a certain way. Now, people have approached me in, in recent years and have said that they've recognized my style and they've found my work elsewhere. Um, for good and bad reasons, you know, a lot of my work does get plagiarized, stolen, used on other products, that kind of thing. But as I mentioned, I, you know, I have a wonderful <laughs> manager who nips that in the bud as soon as possible. But um, but it does happen. You know, my work has been seen, and people have said, "I knew it was yours. I recognize your style." And that was a really big surprise to me because I didn't think I didn't think I had a style. Um, but I'm starting to recognize from the other side of the mirror that. Oh, the, yeah, it's the crisp, it's the, the fog I use. There's certain signatures that I will I will include over and over again that's that's my sort of my go-to vibe or my go-to feel when I'll execute a piece. The composition tends to be very sharp in certain areas, and I'm a stickler for detail. So when most people might be a little loose and a little more colourful, a little more blurry in areas, um, I keep my, my work particularly sharp in terms of realism, even if it's something that to our knowledge couldn't possibly exist i'll execute it in such a way that what if it did and i think people are starting to see my work you know they'll recognize it and so for example with the as you mentioned there the ministry album i did the uh americant which came out that album was i think 2018 but americant features the lady liberty statue of liberty uh in new york um, but she's sort of doing a face palm like you know oh God, what have we done? You know, this mm -hmm. America's in such turmoil. And that was the idea that Al wanted. So Al Jorgensen, the singer of ministry said, you know, I want this idea uh, executed. And he had it in his mind of the shame and, and just the awfulness of where we were at that point. Um, and so I executed it, but again, I added the fog and the lights and the crisp and the detail, and it was still a peace of mind. Mm -hmm. um, because of course anybody could throw a photograph on there and just photoshop it together and slap it on and you know that's that but I wanted to repaint every little piece of stone every little wrinkle of her fabric that is you know copper iron just have it look like a big old statue and to physically paint that with a and it sounds bizarre doesn't it it sounds you know <laughs> like an oxymoron but to digitally paint it and mm -hmm. feel every little piece of that stroke of that cursor to then zoom out and see it as a final piece it's the same process with everything i do it has the same techniques and over time now i i guess i have come to the position where i do have a certain style that people are starting to spot which is actually a really nice feeling <laughs> oh yes you you definitely have a signature and let's address that signature that style i i find it to be you encompass very niche from you using a mouse instead of a pen, from the type of work you do, and I'm sure the type of work you don't do. Can you speak on being comfortable with staying true to your passion? Uh, I'll give you an example. Someone asked me <laughs> once to paint, you know, their little puppy dog snookums with butterflies and rainbows in the background. and. If you see my work, you know that that's not going to happen. And I, I passed up on it, even though it would have been very lucrative. And you seem to be the same type of artist that uh, you stay true to your passion and what you do. Can you speak on that? Yeah. Um, and I completely relate to what you're saying there. I mean, I love, you know, little 
kittens and puppies and and uh, i enjoy fruit as much as the next person mm -hmm. but i'm not going to illustrate those things um as you say you know my passion isn't those things because you do see those things every day um and yet people will approach me um and say uh i'd, I'd like you to do a portrait of my whole family but can you make us look victorian well now that's interesting and of course the victoriana aesthetic is very appealing to me um but that's not something that wholly interests me um and so though it may you know pull in a, a nice chunk of change for me it's not something that i'm really going to enjoy doing and therefore it's going to take longer which mm -hmm. is going to make me hate it even more um i i like things that i can really get my teeth into that i can do very quickly because i'm enjoying it you know um life's too short um we only really so far as we know have one shot at it at this time at least and to sort of you know waste it on things you don't enjoy um some things are necessary we have our day jobs and i take my hat off to anyone who has to do that in order to support their family and you know every credit to you but there are times where i think to myself you know goodness i'm fortunate that currently i don't have children i i mean i definitely want them but i'm very fortunate at this point in my life where i can execute every hour of the day to be mine mm -hmm. and I, I i really make the most of it um because the older i get the more i'm realizing how little time we have and it really only sort of um it really only hit me when when i turned 40 i thought oh cripes you know if i live to 80 i've got 2000 weeks left <laughs> that's it <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it doesn't sound like a lot of time. Um, and I, I said that to a friend and they said, oh, well, think about it. It's even worse when you say you only have 40 summers left. Yeah. Well, goodness me. I mean, <laughs> you know, take every day that you can and make the most of it. So, so yes, I mean, there are gigs that will come across my table that people will say, you know, we'll pay you this much if you can do that for us. And I have to say, I'm really sorry. Um, I'm currently very booked up or uh, this just isn't what I do or, you know, in the nicest possible way. Um, and, I, and that's another thing, you, you know, you have to be nice <laughs> to yeah. everybody. It's very important. <laughs> you know, if you don't like it, that's fine, but you have to be really polite about it. Have you ever had a client say, whoa, that's too dark. <laughs> You're scaring the hell out of me. Or maybe that's uh, what they want. Maybe that's when you really hit it. But has anyone said, hey, Mr. Sam, you're, you're kind of scaring me right now. <laughs> can, you, can you back um, off a little bit? <laughs> no, but it's funny, it's funny you say that. Um, I'm currently writing a collection of short horror stories for myself. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my girlfriend is proofreading it. You know, she's just another set of eyes, another mind to go through and pick up things that I may have missed. And it's very important that you have as many people read your work as possible before it even goes to the editor, you know? Um, and so she's wonderfully brilliant at spotting things that just shouldn't be there. And some of the things uh, I've written, she has said, um, oh no, you can't, you can't say that. That's, that's too, <laughs> that's too dark. Uh, that's too, um, no, that's just a no. You have to take that out. You have to edit that, you know. Oh and I think gosh. to myself, you know, in the back of my mind, I think to myself, well, should I leave it in, you know, because at the same time, this is where Clive Barker, again, mm. a wonderful chap, and Stephen King, you know, they have their, they push the envelope just a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And it got them to, it got them to a place of attention where people were shocked by certain things that were written now i don't do it for shock of course I, I do it for the enjoyment of sharing that universe and so i have to be really sensible and say okay yeah actually that's just a little bit too unnecessarily you know it, the, the cow has bled too much <laughs> it, it, that cow's not gonna get up and, anymore you know um you can you can get that little glass of blood from its throat with a little spear jab there and and toast the gods but you've bled it dry now that's too much you can't that's wrong so i have to edit things out um so the cow will go on now um we spoke about this a little bit before but uh forgive me if i asked this already but it, it's just in my head uh i i 
put you in a cross between like Hitchcock, Hieronymus Bosch, and Vincent Price in that group of creators. That's where I see you sitting. And uh, they're all macabre. What? Why is the macabre so important? Why are, why, why are we so attracted to that? Why, why? Of course, there's like documentaries. They're important because we want to learn something. You know, mm-hmm. there's tear jerkers. We want to have this cathartic cry. But the macabre. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why is that theater? That art? What? Why do we need that? It's an interesting one. And again, um, it's similar to what we spoke on earlier, how not enough people really think deep enough as to the why. They could say that they love X, Y, Z, and they can reel off a name of artists and filmmakers and movies and characters within those, but they never really truly ask themselves why do they like those things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, in a roundabout way, I think it's, it's sexy. Mm-hmm. Um, I think for the most part, being a guy, but I, you know, I'm sure it applies to anybody. Um, you want to impress people. You want to sort of, uh, be the, the cool kid at school. And when you get into adulthood, that, that never ends. You know, you still want to be admired. We all selfishly want to be admired. We all have that little self-absorbed kind of, you know, I want to be recognized and it's the recognition of it. So to create something that will get the attention that, that, and, and I'm not saying to sort of as, you know, to our last point, to just straight out shock people. There has to be a meaning. Mm. There has to be a value. And I think that's when it gets sexy. That's when people say, ooh, I really like that. That speaks to me because they feel it. They vibe from it. It's something that they don't see every day, that not everyone can offer them. And again, that's where it comes from the attraction aspect. If you're if you're able to provide, protect, protect, and procreate, you know, some once would say that that's the true meaning of a man, provide, protect, and procreate, but we're beyond that these days. And so what is it that's attractive? What is it that, that someone of the opposite sex will look at a woman for? You know, you have Anne Rice. Why was she so brilliant at, at writing vampires? I think it's because she made them human. It, mm. it, you know, yeah. she made them sexy. She made them viable and accessible to the living she wasn't writing for vampires she was writing for us and she made the, those characters very human because they once were of course um and i think when you when you add that humanity to the unknown to the monsters to the demons to to things that you don't see every day it becomes attractive it becomes something that you want a piece of that selfishly not anyone else can have you want it for yourself and you want to grasp it pull those heartstrings you want to you want to cry at a movie you know, you want to cry a TV commercial because you heard a song that reminds you of, you know, a dog you once owned. Those things are what speak to me when it's when it's horror, when it's dark, when it's macabre, as you say. You know, you, you mentioned Vincent Price there. I absolutely love him. Um, to, what a cool cat, you know. Right. He was cool. He was cool. Yeah. With that strange voice. Yeah. You know, he had, uh, you know, he, he was sexy. He was, uh, he was masculine. But at the same time, he was like a, a strange elf type creature from another world. Just the way he spoke and the way he delivered himself in a not too camp, but on the edge of camp, very peculiar way. And it was all a sort of an act, but there was also who he was. And I think if, if anyone can deliver that in their artwork or their music or their, you know, their film, their writing, it's not something you see every day. And it, it becomes very, very attractive. And I think that's why people dig it so much. And I'd have to say you're very right with that, uh, Mr. Sam. It's not something you see every day. And it takes a very skilled artisan to bring it to the public and invite them into it and make them want to be scared instead of being scared of it and running away. And I think a lot of your artwork provides that. And I'd like to Thank you for that, and thank you for sharing the inside of your dark, psyche, wonderful, mad, brilliant, sexy world with us here today. And with that, um, could you tell our viewers and listeners, do you take commissions from just an average Joe, somebody that could be listening now if they wanted something? How, how does that work? 
Absolutely. Um, I mean, if anyone wanted to reach out to me and just have a conversation um, and maybe explore some ideas, um, and indeed, you know, if they wanted to commission me for anything, uh, they could reach me on, on my website, mrsamsheeran.com, which is the word Mr. M I S T E R, Sam Sheeran, S A G A R O N, so mrsamsheeran.com. And you can find all of my links on there. Um, you could reach out directly through Facebook or Instagram. Um, and I'm very, you know, I'm very approachable. I'm not so, I'm not so creepy in real life. <laughs> and I can attest to that because I'm sure if some people weren't familiar with your work, they would assume, wow, this guy's probably an ax murderer or some real creepy guy. But I have found oh, you I'm that too. too. I'm that too. <laughs> You're that too in his mad dreams. But uh, I'd have to say I find you to be quite pleasant and very much of a gentleman. And it is an honor to ever keep your company. So thank you so much for being on the show and giving us an insight to your artful world. And that's going to well, do it for us likewise. today. <laughs> that's going to do it for us today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the interview with Mr. Sam. If you enjoyed this episode, check out the others and tell a friend. And until the next time, be well. Be well.